Welcome to the CNBC Africa debate on accelerating infrastructure coming to you from the 25th World Economic Forum on Africa in Cape Town, South Africa. I'm joined this morning by the Honorable Minister of Finance for South Africa, Minister Nene. To his right, we have Sim Shabalala, who's Joint Chief Executive Officer of the Standard Bank Group Limited. Mr. Siabonga Gama, who is the CEO of Transnet Limited South Africa. Adam Iqdal, who is CEO of BCG Sub-Sahara. Patrick Lamini, who is Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of the Development Bank of Southern Africa. And of course, Mr. Gordon Brown, who is Chair of the World Economic Forum Global Strategic Infrastructure Initiative at the World Economic Forum. Thank you so much for your time. We've heard, just to say a little context, we've celebrated the success of the Central Corridor this morning, which has basically linked five <coughs> countries in East Africa. We're talking here about Tanzania, Kenya, Burundi, Rwanda, and also about Uganda. Essentially what we've seen is that this project was initiated in June 2014. In nine months, we have seen the accelerated phase of this mega program. 121 projects, sub-projects have been identified and 23 cornerstone projects. Of the 23 cornerstone projects, four of them have already been taken to bankability phase and another four just need a couple of additional research before we see them coming to bankability phase as well. So we are celebrating a, a great journey over the last nine months. And Minister Nene, I turn to you and say, what lessons can we learn from the Central Corridor in bringing the North-South Corridor to fruition, which South Africa is leading the charge for? Thank you very much, uh, Bronwyn, and um, good morning to all of you again. But uh, it is indeed um, a milestone worth uh, celebrating. Um, it was uh, just last year when uh, the project uh, kick-started and uh, with um, um, a lot of enthusiasm that we have seen uh, coming from uh, uh, former Prime Minister Gordon Brown here, our president and uh, the team that has been working on, uh, on this. Uh, and uh, it's uh, actually encouraging to see that in the, because this is the most difficult and important phase of uh, uh, project implementation the pr project preparation stage is the most difficult one, and I think most projects fail and su or succeed at that stage. Bringing it to bankability stage and um, listening to the report that we had during the breakfast here has actually given us uh, um, you know, the confidence uh, that uh, indeed we can learn from this one, replicate it uh, in all other, our, our other projects. And I was saying to Mr. Lamini here, all now that remains is uh, um, to see the first crane, um, you know, uh, being raised. And um, I think um, we indeed are encouraged and quite excited about it. Mr. Brown, one of the challenges that we're aware of is the changing of governments on a regular basis. And with that comes changing policy. I know you're passionate <coughs> about this arena, so perhaps you can weigh in at this point, sir. I think what's made the Central Corridor work is political will from the leaders of the countries, cross-border cooperation, a real focus on delivery and implementation. And this should be a pilot to teach us how we can deal with the 100 billion gap in infrastructure spending every year. Uh, a third of Africa only has electricity. We still have to do a huge amount about water and sanitation. We've just been discussing roads, rails, and transport networks. And this investment is desperately needed. And so we have got to get to a position where we can persuade the whole investor community private and public cooperation, that these projects, uh, we have minimized the risks, we've got the will to go ahead with them, we've got the coordination and the focus on implementation that is necessary, and I believe we're at the start of the building of the infrastructure that Africa needs to raise the growth rate, to employ thousands, indeed tens of thousands of uh, people, and to improve the quality of life for the citizens. So infrastructure may sound a boring term, but it's about the social and economic fabric about the roads, the rails, the, the power, the electricity, the hydropower. Certainly, certainly not boring, sir. It is done. central to our survival. And I come back to the question that I asked in terms of consistency of government policy with changing governments uh, across Africa. But, 
you, the but infrastructure that, projects are long-term in nature. You're saying get everybody to buy into that. Is that what you were You've implying? got to buy into it, but you've got to minimize the risk. So we've got to deal with regulatory risk. People's fear that the regulatory system may change. Political risk, as you say. Currency risk on occasion, construction risk. But you know, I find the perception of risk is far, if you like, uh, worse than the real risk. When it comes down to looking at the actual risk, you can actually satisfy investors that things will be done. But particularly so, if your focus is on political leaders cooperating to deliver and to focus on that implementation. Now, once we do that, I think we get the investors coming in. And what does the private sector take away from the, the central corridor as a successful learning? I think there are three main lessons to be learned from the work in the central corridor. Um, number one, you need a real and formal commitment by heads of state. And I think the work done on the central corridor was a great uh, example of that. Uh, not, on, not only lip service, but actual formal commitment and signatures are necessary also to address the perceived and real risk from private sector. Uh, number two, you have to have a very transparent and open trust-based uh, environment. Uh, in the beginning of all these processes, people tend to you know, keep things fairly close, but you need to be very, very open and very transparent in order to have a good working relationship. And number three, you need a real program management uh, unit uh, that can drive uh, these processes uh, forward. You need real deliverables, you need real faces, accountability and responsibility. So if people are not doing their job, there has to be uh, a negative sanction attached to that. So real program management uh, as well. So one of the blockages when it comes to infrastructure, short-term finance, or early stage, not short-term, sorry, we're talking about a long-term game here, but early stage finance. I think you're well-placed to put forward some solutions on that front. Yes, I think there are a couple of points there. Firstly, project air preparation facilities exist. Um, they can be accessed. But ultimately, what you need is bidders who are able to have sufficient equity to finance uh, the, the, the projects. To the extent that you require uh, funding from government, government needs to be ready to recover tariffs that uh, cover, cover costs. To the extent that governments require funding for that purpose, um, there are these facilities from the multilateral agencies, from the DFIs, and in addition, there are some innovations such as in the uh, re uh, renewables uh, program in South Africa, you had better, better recovery fees. Um, which government could use as part of the cost recovery recovery mechanism. So innovation in partnership uh, with the public sector, DFIs, and, uh, and bidders. Sia Bonga, what about the ability to deliver or to execute these large infrastructure uh, projects? Do we have the capacity? It's quite important um, at the project preparation stage that uh, we begin to look at uh, what kind of capacity uh, exists um, in terms of uh, uh, both human and physical capacity uh, that would assist us in terms of moving forward. I think um, we still have quite a bit of a backlog um, in terms of the kind of capacity that is required uh, for delivery on time and on cost. Um, we we do have um, uh, quite a number of um, um, uh, interventions within Transnet through the uh, Transnet Academy, uh, where we are looking at um, um, you know, um, training engineers and apprenticeships uh, in terms of artisans, because I think uh, the artisanal sort of skills that uh, are required for, in order for us to execute these uh, large projects on the continent uh, are probably not, not there. So we are training close to between 3,000 and 5,000 people every year, uh, far in excess of uh, our own needs in order for us to try and uh, bring up to speed um, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, skills and capacity that we require to deliver on uh, capital projects of this nature. Patrick, when we're talking about local context, that has been a key theme here at the World Economic Forum. So how do we deal with unsolicited bids in the infrastructure space, specifically when it comes to Chinese unsolicited bids? That's a very interesting question, Bronwyn. <laughs> <laughs> but it, all these issues, in actual fact, they require a legal framework and governance, and governance structure that regulates the handling of unsolicited, unsolicited bids. That if you have a very transparent uh, governance system in place, you then know exactly how you can be able to engage and entertain unsolicited bids. I don't think they are wrong per se, 
because they are saying there are people waiting on the wings who are itching and interested in getting involved. You just need to be able and to know how then you tell them, guys, this is not yet the time. When the time comes, we'll take you into account and we'll make sure that we advise you. And in the central corridor space, there were so many private and public companies that were involved, which helped a great deal in identifying and, and throwing issues onto the fore for all actually to deliberate on and agree on how we move forward. But unsolicited bids really require a governance structure and a very well articulated position on how we actually entertain and engage them. Minister Khadebe earlier spoke of making a hub for rolling stock in South Africa to deploy effective assets across Africa from a rail perspective. How far are we on that project? And I believe that came directly out of conversations at Davos and was executed shortly thereafter. Indeed, and as you said, uh, Mr. Gama uh, uh, here actually uh, did uh, uh, give a bit of detail on, on, on the matter because um, Transnet and Prasa are responsible for the implementation, and um, that is actually at an advanced stage, and I would want to believe that we are ready to, um, to start producing. And as uh, he said, that has got uh, um, uh, uh, huge benefits, not only for South Africa, but also for the, for the continent at large, because that would actually um, uh, uh, provide a scale at which we are going to be, and the economies of scale will actually uh, be of benefit to all of us. But the skills also that uh, Mr. Gama spoke about um, are also are going to got, need more of those skills in order to be able to do that, but um, in, in a lot of other uh, spillover uh, effects uh, um, which are going to be positive for our economies. Just before we move off the railing stock, Siobonga, you want to perhaps just take us a little further on, on the story? We are assembling locomotives so people can go and see live um, uh, the assembly of locomotives, uh, which I think will give the confidence and impetus um, in terms of um, the kind of work that um, uh, we say we can do. And I think uh, also from... Um, um, you know, a capacity building perspective, where we, we also offer maritime as well as rail and rail engineering expertise, um, which is available for everybody in the continent. In fact, um, a few of the countries like Namibia, uh, La Reunion, and Mauritius are, have already started to take up uh, some of this capacity in order to help us. Because I think um, uh, when we talk about these projects, um, it's important that uh, there's uh, not just alignment in terms of vision, but that everybody can coordinate the kind of um, expertise that is required so that we can execute all of them at the same time. It's quite um, critical. What's incredibly exciting about the conversation to this point is the execution that we're seeing coming out of the conversations, out of forums, especially Davos into the World Economic Forum on Africa. Mr. Brown, 51 mega programs have been identified by PETA, the Program for Infrastructure Development in Africa. The Central Corridor is number one. It's off the ground, it's through that acceleration phase and it's been handed over to NEPAD. So we have another 50 to roll out. You mentioned political will earlier in the discussion. Is that central to this? Adam mentioned that it took head of state's meeting on a regular basis to Absolutely. make the central corridor come to fruition? Yeah, these, these projects are gonna work if there's political leadership, and sometimes it's cross-border cooperation that's needed, so the leaders of each country have gotta be behind these projects, but there's gotta be this emphasis on delivery and implementation, uh, monitoring uh, the level of delivery and the speed of delivery, but we are going to have to have international finance. And when you raised the question of China uh, earlier, uh, we need finance from China, America, Europe, as well as from within Africa. You're talking about 1.5 trillion over 15 years that is needed at a conservative estimate for uh, investment in this uh, continent for infrastructure. You're talking about the power industry alone, where it's about more than half of that and a third of Africans, remember, do not have electricity. And so the numbers who are denied electricity at the moment are more than 600 million, and we've got to do something about that, and water and sanitation and everything else. So we're going to need a partnership between the international institutions and international investors uh, with domestic mobilization of uh, finance and partnership between the public and private sector. So political will, yes. Cooperation and coordination, yes. Delivery, yes but we're gonna to need to find the finance and we've got to prove to people who want to invest that we can minimize the risks 
that they perceive and the risks that actually do exist that have got to be dealt with. Adam, that's hit a note with you, has it? Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's, it's a very good uh, point, uh, Gordon. And, um, you know, every month uh, we get requests uh, from private investors who want to come into Africa and, and finance infrastructure projects. It's private equity, it's sovereign wealth funds, it's large pension funds, everyone will go in, so the, the, the money is there. The problem is that these guys and we, we are experts in looking at operational risk, uh, technical risk, environmental risk, that, that's all kind of manageable. The one key element which is difficult to understand for most of the external investors is the, the political risk, because these are long-term, multi-year projects and have transnational complications and implications. So without a firm long-term commitment uh, from politicians, it's actually difficult to have a bankable project. And you know, there are elections, so sometimes you know, short-term priorities might come before longer-term priorities. So this goes back to what we said in the beginning. You have to have a formal binding commitment from the heads of state level uh, in order to make that. And I think the work in the Central Corridor is a good example of that. Will you admit, um, right. will you? I, if I see Wonga, I'm coming to you, but I am <coughs> aware that Minister Ntlantanene is being uh, called to the next session. So I am going to do something unusual in television, and I am going to get a closing comment from you, sir, on, and then I'm going to move through closing comments from everybody, um, and I'm going to ask you to leave your, your seat after that. So, and I, and I will make sure that our audience understands exactly what we're doing. We appreciate you. So. The, the bottom line is that capital flows where capital is welcome. We need, and we've heard it, foreign direct investment. We need to mobilize domestic resources when it comes to funding our infrastructure deficit. Minister, closing thank, comments thank from you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, thanks, Mayor Bronin. Uh, is it the point you've just made with regards to a, 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 set, a binding arrangement, a mechanism between uh, states. We had a discussion earlier uh, with uh, Maria and Patrick. She was saying precisely that, that these um, uh, projects are huge and um, any risk uh, you know, that might arise would actually jeopardize uh, an, an important uh, development. So it would be important that we do have, you know, we, either you establish an entity that would be able to coordinate that, that would have a, a particular standing, but uh, clear protocols uh, so that uh, it bi it's binding on the countries, not only on the administration of the time, but also beyond that administration, because these are long-term, huge projects that are for the benefit of all. And um, it is, this is what we're about. We actually want um, uh, sustainable development uh, for our continent, and uh, we also would want these uh, to, to, to carry us into the next generation and, uh, and after. So it is indeed, uh, uh, you know, there are signs that this is achievable. And uh, with the private sector and government coming together, um, there is um, no better platform to be able to execute that. And uh, we're truly grateful that this initiative is receiving uh, the uh, um, um, uh, attention and the enthusiasm that it is receiving. We stand behind it. Thank you very much. Minister, thanks very much. And uh, please, uh, I hope you get to your next session in time, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Sim, let's move to closing comments from, from your side, again on, on the central theme that we're discussing today. Just three points. The first one is it's fantastic to see the level of coordination and cooperation that is happening uh, and the levels of trust that are being built, uh, and this is fantastic. Secondly, there are huge amounts uh, required, uh, and I think they will be forthcoming to the extent that there are clear mandates from the various players, DFIs, government, uh, and the private sector. Uh, and thirdly, um, the importance of sanctity of contract in the various countries where we're operating is very, very important in this context. We haven't spoken about it, but it is important for us to shore it up and reinforce it. Sia Bonga. Well, um, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, from someone who is uh, always uh, trying to develop this or the other infrastructure project, uh, when I have uh, uh, some bankers here, I always want uh, to challenge them. Uh, in terms of uh, what, are, what are the kind of uh, innovative ideas that they can come up with in terms of um, financing these projects because uh, some of our countries are already highly indebted and um, uh, if you want to get an extra guarantee from the treasury, you're not likely to get it. And uh, this is uh, some of the things that uh, often forestall uh, some of these projects and um, uh, we probably need to say how do you match some of these um, um, you know, uh, liabilities with the assets that they're creating so that um, uh, you are able to uh, bottom 
uh, the financing of projects. So uh, I think um, um, as we come to the execution of these projects, uh, the financial institutions, commercial banks, DFIs, um, uh, need to really come up with uh, innovative strategies to assist us to accelerate um, uh, the execution of these projects. Adam. Yeah, I think uh, what's important now is uh, for the community to see real action. Uh, there are a lot of analysis, a lot of paper on the table, but to get investor confidence, they have to see real action now. And, that, and that, again, it goes back to we want to see clear deliverables, clear faces, clear accountabilities and responsibilities, and make those public so people can actually be held accountable if those deadlines are not met. So I think As everyone... demonstrated by the Central Corridor Program. Yes. yes. Patrick. I think we are now moving into the next big challenge in terms of just the Central Corridor. Infrastructure has a potential role in the global value chains. These corridors, as we're actually bringing them about, and the infrastructure networks, we need to make sure that we are able actually to say we are efficient and we're effective in these corridors so mm. that we can be competitive globally because global supply chain have got their own sub actually challenges and we need to be able to rise to those challenges. And just to talk to Mr. Gamma's challenge, I think investors need well-prepared <laughs> well structured with the right regulatory environment to play and to put their money into the projects. And I think this is what now we need to make sure that we can demonstrate to the rest of the world that we can be able actually to do it successfully. And then a, a final word, Mr. Brown. If Africa had the infrastructure it really needs, then its growth rate at the moment would be as high as that of China, as high as that of India. This is the potential. 80 million jobs have got to be created a year uh, for the growing population of young people, it can only be done with high growth. High growth depends on investing in infrastructure, and it depends on us getting these questions right. Uh, delivery, coordination, political will to move it forward, finding the finances, minimizing the risk. And so the opportunities for Africa with its uh, resources, uh, with also its population of young people, with its ability to expand its agriculture industry are immense if we could get these infrastructure problems sorted out. Mr. Brown, I think that's a perfect place to end our conversation. Thank you so much, gentlemen, and thank you so much for joining us for this CNBC Africa debate on accelerating infrastructure coming to you from the 25th World Economic Forum on Africa in Cape Town, South Africa. Yeah.